Prime Minister Commodore Borenge Banimarama says preparations for the meeting are well underway and he's looking forward to meeting the interested Pacific leaders. Thanks very much. We've had a somewhat unexpected invitation to a private party at the Prime Minister's official residence high above the capital Suva. The self-proclaimed PM and his wife Mary a gracious host. Hi, thanks for having us. You're most welcome. You're most Hello, welcome. Good, good and you? Good, good. Thanks very much. Quite a party you've got here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're everybody together. Go, blow. One, another one. Yeah. Bye. It's Sunday and a proud grandfather is relaxing with his extended family. Frank Bainimarama's grandson David is five years old today and in Fijian tradition he's wished a long and happy life. People in Fiji are very passionate about our families. Not only me and my family, a whole lot of us. Okay. Commodore Frank Bainimarama rarely grants access to his private world but as we were to see during our assignment, the coup leader, self-styled moral and political compass and chief censor was on occasions remarkably, well, frank. Are we are uh, shown in, in the TV and uh, in the papers every day as, uh, as uh, dictators. Dictators in the sense that we go around abusing the powers that we have. That doesn't happen here. You are a military dictator, though. Uh, I am a military man, but uh, uh, what does dic uh, dictator mean to you? Well, you do have a very firm grip on Fiji and society. Yes, but that, is that uh, what dictatorship is about? Then if that, have, that is the definition of dictator, then I guess most of the countries in the region have dictators. Next round of games. Uh, you have to do that. The rolling family showcase would take us to Saturday sports day and netball with his daughter, Dee. I've heard your dad loves karaoke. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, he loves his music. He loves his music and he loves his jokes and he loves his practical jokes. Still love coming along and watching? Yes, yes, very much. Especially when my grandchildren play. It's the tough, rough and tumble of rugby that's the Commodore's preferred code. At Suva's Albert Park, the home team is playing visitors Nervosa. It's a hard, uncompromising game, and this military man couldn't enjoy it more. It is, after all, the way he plays the big game here in Fiji. And he's playing a long game too. It's his Fiji until at least 2014. When you took over the government in 2006, you said elections within one year, then it was elections within two years, then it was elections in four years, now it's elections within eight years. Come 2014, is Fiji definitely going to have a democratic election? Well, I said 2014 we'll have democratic election. Fiji's coup culture began back in 1987. Colonel Sidavani Rambuka staged two of them with the aim of asserting ethnic Fijian dominance over Indian Fijians. I believe it is in the national interest that I carry out the events of this morning, the takeover of the government. Then came the civilian-led George Spate coup of 2000. This whole scenario here is for the world to focus attention on what we Fijians want. Okay? It was Frank Baini Marama who, after almost 10 weeks, finally crushed the revolt. He installed a prime minister and six years later, 
he deposed Lysenia and Garase for backing an amnesty for the Spate gang. As of six o'clock this evening, the military has taken over the government, has executive authority, and the running of this country. Last year, Baini Marama scrapped the constitution and now rules by decree. Why do you think you are the best man to make decisions on behalf of almost 900,000 well, Fijians? Well, uh, it's not me, really. It, it's the military. I also mentioned this, that the military is the only entity that can bring about the reforms. The politicians can't bring about the reforms for obvious reason. Uh, they are politicians, they would love to stay in power and because of that, uh, they don't like uh, much to bring about changes that would remove them from power. And those are the changes that we are putting in place now. But you've already been in power almost four years. By the time the elections come about, it'll be 2014. You will have been in power for eight years without a mandate from the people. Yes, but we believe as long as we're doing the reforms that will bring about a better Fiji, that's good enough for us. As long as there's no abuse of power. If there's any sign of corrupt uh, uh, dealings, we have people removed. In Bani Marama's world, you don't call him dictator and don't describe him as a one-man ban. He insists the military runs a benign regime. But spend a week in Fiji and that simply doesn't stand up. Bani Marama is an intimidating authority figure and he's feared. The media decree and public emergency laws means very few Fijians will express their views publicly. For this story, I approached several previously outspoken Fijians who either fail to turn up to confirmed interviews, ask for questions in advance, or express fear that their phones were being tapped. We know exactly who's saying what, even though they're not saying it uh, publicly, we know what's happening. <clears throat> Do you bug phones? Oh, no. <laughs> no, we're not the Australian government, thank you. <laughs> the non-compliant are dealt with swiftly. Baini Marama has sacked judges and expelled critics and diplomats. There are, though, a brave few prepared to stand up and challenge the regime. Reverend Akila Yambaki of the Citizens' Constitutional Forum is one of them. He's particularly concerned about the crackdown on freedom of expression. Well, it, the censorship uh, is quite serious, quite severe within the, the press, in the press and also the electronic media. I mean, the fact that now they, um, they have decided to, um, to register all holders of public phones and um, mobile phones should be registered. I think that is just an extension of it. Uh, see, when you try and uh, muffle the media, there are other ways in which uh, uh, the, the people get things out. One of the ways Baini Marama asserts his authority is by controlling what Fijians read and hear. He's the nation's news director. He's the nation's censor. It's eight o'clock and the deadline is looming at the Fiji Sun, one of three English language dailies. Stories are being filed and edited, but what runs and what doesn't run will be determined in this room. This is okay. So, so this page is okay. We've been invited to see the chief censor at work. He's in his 20s, related to the interim prime minister, and ironically, he's asked us to censor him. Why have you asked us not to show your face? Uh, it's obviously not something that's, that nobody would like to do. I mean, I wouldn't go around asking people, would you like to go censor the newspapers, you know? That's infringement on media's, media freedom, 
But then again, what really is media freedom, you know? The chief censor is one of five who do the rounds of Fiji's media to make sure the interim government is portrayed in a positive light. Most have never worked as journalists. I studied at uni um, in Fiji, I studied journalism and politics. And so you have a fair idea of how the world operates and you know it's not fair with what we're doing with the media. I mean, it's, but it's appropriate given that we've gone through some rough times. I think this is one of the testing times for the local media industry in the country. Uh, it's a testing time for us. This is the stance we have taken as a newspaper, this newspaper, that we are pro Fiji. And sometimes that can mean Fiji's Ministry of Information is the only source of political news in the paper. It gets boring to read the papers anyway. It's, uh, it's all about sports and uh, fundamentalist stuff that comes out in and the same people uh, write because they get through the censorship. I think we are not favoured by the censors. We, and therefore, people are not hearing their critical stance, which needs to be heard so that we can work out a constructive way forward. Radio is the major source of news for Fijians. Commercial radio director Vijay Narayan is in charge of the news that's broadcast on five stations in three languages throughout the islands. We are passionate about what we do. We are passionate about what uh, we have to do for the people of Fiji. We know that that's our uh, prime uh, responsibility and uh, we are trying our very best to do that. Narayan says he's able to broadcast some measured criticism of the government, but the rigour of the official censors has also seen some editors fall into line by self-censoring. A new media decree was imposed just six weeks ago. It means journalists and media organisations face hefty fines and imprisonment if they act contrary to what the interim government claims is in the national interest. And that's your Legend FM News and Sports. Join us again at nine. The new decree bans foreign ownership of the media. It directly targets Fiji's oldest independent newspaper, the Fiji Times. It's 90% owned by Rupert Murdoch's News Limited. It looks like the Fiji Times will close down. How do you feel about that? I feel disappointed because there will be a lot of job losses. But uh, as I continuously said, Philippa, uh, that's not my doing. That was the doing of the management. The Times declined the ABC's request for an interview and would not allow filming inside the newsroom. News Limited has less than two months to find a buyer for its shares. They've never acknowledged me as Prime Minister of this nation, even though I've been Prime Minister for the last four years. So they've got to go? No, it's really not that. But what I'm saying is they're not doing the right thing by the people of this nation. The military's iron grip on the country isn't readily obvious to visitors. The roadblocks and night curfews which followed the coup are long gone. So it's not surprising that Australians and New Zealanders find Fiji an affordable paradise. Financially, it was fantastic. We got a really good deal. We got a really good deal. We got uh, seven nights for the price of four. We have over 40,000 Australians that come in every month to tell us that Fiji is great. They're holding by their feet. So uh, who's the loser here? Certainly not Fiji. The truth is, though, this high volume business has only been achieved through a radical devaluation of the Fiji dollar. The hotels and their employees 
don't make much money. Even the tourists see that Fijians are struggling. My husband and I were sitting on the grass enjoying the view and I said, I feel really guilty. And he asked why and I said, well, you know, we're here and we're relaxing and you can see all the people working around you and, you know, on the drive up here, you could tell that there were quite a few um, shanty settlements. For all of Bainimarama's Marama's so-called reforms, and he's very vague about what they are, Fiji is hurting. The economy is fragile, and rural Fijians are moving to where there's work and educational opportunities. By some estimates, 15% of Fijians now live in squatter camps, and in the capital, it could be as high as 20%. <laughs> there are nine of these squatter camps dotted around central Suva alone. They're home to thousands of Fijians who live in extremely cramped conditions. Kelly Arani Lakui has lived here for four years with her extended family. Uh, it's my uh, rooms, my husband and uh, myself and our three children. We sleep here. So five people sleep yeah, in this room? Yeah. Even though Mrs. Lakui's husband is in full-time work, a home of their own beyond the settlement can only be a dream. Uh, there's a little bit of space between the houses, but as you can see, the people are uh, living a pretty roughly. Father Kevin Barr is a Catholic priest who's worked among the poorest in Fiji for more than 30 years. Poverty has been increasing steadily since uh, independence. I think in 1977, it was about uh, seven to nine percent of people in poverty. Now the figure is about 40 to 45 percent. Poverty is a big, big issue everywhere, especially so in the small Pacific Island development states. We're not kidding anyone, but we're trying to get out of that. Because the squatter settlements have grown in numbers. Yes. 43% of people yes. living it, below the poverty yes. line. Yes, and it, it'll grow because uh, we're trying to stop that because of uh, uh, families that are trying to move into the urban areas for education, and mostly that. And we're trying to keep uh, that in the rural areas so they don't have to come up. One of Father Barr's priorities is to try and empower Fijians in the squatter settlements to urge them to be more proactive in making decisions for themselves, a kind of community democracy, which since the coup has eluded Fiji. We say to people, wake up and uh, look around you, see what your problems are and see what you can do about them. Take responsibility. And our motto is stand up and walk, stand up and talk. Stand on your own two feet, speak out for yourselves. So we encourage people to take responsibility and overcome that culture of silence. Fiji's sugar industry is in desperate trouble and they've been asking the military regime for help. This rail bridge at Singatoka was wiped away by floods two years ago. It hasn't been repaired and that alone has increased production costs. Infrastructure across the country is failing. The future looks really bleak, really bad, because uh, the cost of uh, production is very high and the sugar price is going low. For example, the farmers uh, will get this year uh, about $50 per tonne. And the cost of production is about $40 per tonne or more. So basically, we are left out with no, very little profit. 200,000 people, about a quarter of the national population, are reliant on the sugar industry. But it's getting harder to make money. The European Union has told Fiji that it's prepared to help restructure the industry. $300 million is on the table, but the price is a return to democratic government. Baini Marama's refused. Since the coup three and a half years ago, Australia, New Zealand and others 
have tried to isolate Fiji diplomatically and economically. It's been suspended from the Commonwealth and the Pacific Islands Forum. But these penalties seem only to have strengthened Barney Marama's determination to run his own race. And as part of that, he invited the Melanesian Brotherhood to this meeting last week to show that Fiji still carries weight in the Pacific. It's quite normal here. If you've been to Africa and you see those countries that are run by military are different, uh, he is doing what is best for Fiji people. That's what he believes and uh, he has done that. And the pomp and ceremony continues as if to reassure Fijians that everything's just fine. Today, Fiji's Navy is celebrating a birthday, 35 years of patrolling the waters around the country's 300 scattered islands. It was the only job Commodore Baini Marama had known before commandeering a country. This was where I started in 75. Oh, wow. It has a special place for me. For the Navy and Army, coup rule has had some benefits. While other government departments are struggling, there's been a 40% increase in the defence budget. Baini Marama is a Methodist, but has no hesitation intimidating preachers. 27 church leaders are charged with organising meetings in breach of public emergency regulations. You've effectively silenced the church and the chiefs, haven't you? Well, yes, in a way. But, uh, you know, Philip, for, to, for us to bring about these reforms, as I've said, we need to, we need to stop all uh, uh, people speaking out against the government and its reform. And these two entities were most vocal because they were politicised. So I need to silence them. I need to have them silenced. Since the first coup 23 years ago, the Indo-Fijian community has shrunk. But for those that stay, Bani Marama claims to be an advocate of all Fijians living together in racial harmony. That's what he says is motivating him to eventually change the constitution and electoral laws. For now, Fijians wait. Will you run for Prime Minister come democratic elections? Philip, I can't make up that this is a no. So I, you may? I, I, I really don't know. To tell you the truth, I have, people have asked me about it, but I have not even thought about uh, making plans for that. Because if I do that, it will change the way I think about the reform that we're doing. Because I'll think like a politician, and as a politician, we're not going to bring about the reforms that we want to put in. So at the moment, you're thinking like a military man and a military leader running a country, but you won't rule out running for prime minister come 2014. Well, think about it when the time comes, but not right now.